Hello, this is Pastor Brian Johnston. I am very blessed to have had a godly legacy, godly parents, grandparents who served the Lord for as long as I know. And uh, they were faithfully serving the Lord, involved in a good church. When in the mid 70s, Pastor Leroy Pennell, this young man came to Barry to begin the Heritage Baptist Church. And it wasn't long after he began that my parents felt led of the Lord to become involved at that church. Uh, that affected, obviously, the rest of my life and my upbringing, and I'm so thankful for it and the life and ministry of Pastor and Mrs. Pennell. I was just a baby, born in January of 76, uh, and grew up in the nursery and Sunday schools of this new church. Oh, what a church it was. How exciting were those days. And uh, Pastor Pennell uh, started the church after some days of uh, great leading of the Lord in his own life. You know, uh, a man, Sidney Kerr, in Bible college who challenged the young men to be soul winners, who told them about something called pastor school. And, that all had an impact on Pastor Pennell's life. He began going to those pastor schools and um, again, through the leading of the Lord, felt that he should start a Baptist church. And uh, that church uh, began with God's great blessings. And it was a time and era when uh, Christians just, many Christians just seemed to rally to the cause and become committed. And my parents were Christians like that. And uh, I'm thankful that my parents were influenced um, by Pastor Pennell in those days. And their, their flame and love for the Lord just grew with Pastor Pennell's uh, leadership and preaching and his own love for the Lord, his passion for soul winning. And uh, I'm just thankful for that. Um, my parents loved Pastor Pennell. <laughs> um, never was a bad word spoken about the preacher. I just recall as a boy, our family having much interaction with the pastor's family and, you know, being in their home and many times them being in our home as I grew up on a farm in our township. And uh, just thankful for him and uh, the stand that the church took, their starting of a Christian school. As a result, I was privileged to attend the Christian school right from the time I was in kindergarten and graduated from grade 12. And uh, so thankful for that. I was just eight years old when my dad was killed in a farm accident. And I remember the time I was pulled out of, I think, the lunchroom, perhaps, at uh, second grade. I was in second grade, pulled out of the lunchroom and had taken up to Pastor Pennell's office and he told us the news of my father being killed in a farm accident. And then later, when I was 16 years old, I remember the time when in high school we run a, uh, an activity, but Pastor Pennell and the principal of the school um, talking to me on a day at that activity and wrapping their arms around me and telling me that my brother Steve was just killed in a car accident. Uh, I remember that ride we took and to go then find my mom to tell her about my brother Stephen having been killed. <sighs> Pastor Pennell has been <laughs> there at all times in my life. And he's loved our family. And I'm just so thankful that my parents were led to the Lord to be faithful and involved members in a church like Heritage Baptist Church. Um, as a teenage boy there, after my brother was, was killed, um, it was a crucial time in my life. It was then that I finally surrendered to the ministry and gave my life to do whatever the Lord wanted me to do. Also that time in my life, my mom was, you know, living a little bit further from the church and just as an older lady, I guess, alone, not too old, but, you know, being uncomfortable driving sometimes in the winter. Uh, it, it led to me getting to spend much time in the home of Pastor and Mrs. Pennell. And uh, I'm thankful for that and uh, the way they loved me and took me in and 
on weekends too. I would, after school, I would just stay in their home and be able to be involved in the bus ministry. I'd drive Mrs. Pennell's little Honda Civic and they go visiting as the bus captain of a bus route. And um, they loved me. You know, they fed me, they cared for me, did family devotions and, you know, prayed with them, kneeling by the couch there at night, the times I spent in their home, and just so thankful for them and their love for me. Pastor Pennell is a, a gentleman. He's been a faithful man. He's always been a man with a great uh, passion for souls and uh, encouraging others to be soul winners. And uh, just thankful for his influence in my life, his love for me and for my family, even still to this day. Um, thankful for the impact that he's had on my life. We love him. We pray for him and his wife. And uh, if you've ever met him, you'll be, be blessed for having met him and known him. And uh, he's a friend. Again, he was there when there was times in my life when I lost dear loved ones, my father, my, my brother. Uh, he was there for my high school graduation. Uh, he was there for my Bible college graduation. He was there for our wedding. In fact, he was the best man uh, in Rachel and, and my, my wedding. And uh, just thankful for him and his friendship. Uh, what a good and godly man, a faithful man he's been. And I'm thankful for his example in my life. Thank you so much. It's always a privilege to come to this church. And so thank you for having me back. I appreciate those kind words of your pastor. And indeed, we love his family and so grateful for the contact we've had over the years. And uh, his parents and family were so involved in Heritage Baptist. His uh, sister, Cheryl, started playing the piano in our church when she was 13 years old and she continued to progress and uh, today she's our music director has been for a number of years and just does an amazing job and she's taught piano to so many people boys and girls over the years and many of them have gone on to be some of the top piano players uh, in ontario that have gone through what do you call that, uh, uh, Ontario? It's a special, anyway, uh, classification, and she's just done a marvelous job. Appreciate it so much. All right, uh, John, 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. Thank you so much for coming this morning. Your being here tells me that you love the Lord, not just the pastor. You knew the pastor would be away today, and you still came to church. So bless your soul for that. 1 John chapter 5. I'm going to read verses 11 through 13. 1 John 5, 11 through 13. The title of the message this morning is, What do we know for sure? What do we know for sure? Let's stand together and follow along as I read 1 John 5, 11 through 13. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come together today because it's the Lord's day, and you've told us in your word that we ought not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And we don't come just because it's expected of us, Lord. We're here because we want to hear from heaven. We want to learn. We want to grow. We want to mature in our Christian faith. So, Lord, please speak to each heart today. You know where everyone is spiritually. It may be, Lord, that you've brought people to this service that are not even saved. 
They do not know the Son of God. I pray that today would be that day where they would be saved, born again into your family. And help each of us that we might be sure of the things that God's word, your word teaches us for these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. What do you know for sure? If people told you to write things down that you know for sure, how long would your list be? John Wesley, the great preacher and founder of the Methodist Church in England years ago, said, when I was a young man, I was sure of everything. But after a few years, having been mistaken a thousand times, I was not half so sure of most things that I was before. And at present, he said, I'm hardly sure of anything except what God has revealed to me. And uh, that's a good statement. Uh, we, we live in a world filled with unclear messages. One of my sons was telling me last night that uh, he was talking to a guy this week, and the guy said, do you have any idea what's going on in this world? My son said, well, what do you mean? He said, with the government, do you know what they're doing, what they're planning? My son said, no. And he said, well, I do. And he said, some of us are preparing for it. We have a place up north of Barrie. We have guns. And we're ready when the government springs their plan. My son said, I got out of there as fast as I could. <laughs> but there are people like that that are just uncertain. There's so much on the internet today and it confuses a lot of people. Every time there's a tragedy of some sort, People come up with all kinds of conspiracy theories of what happened. There's all kinds of conspiracy theories about the fires in Hawaii that took lives. There are lots of conspiracy theories about every time a plane crashes. There's conspiracy theories here and there. You say, what's truth? How do we know what to believe these days? There's so much out there that uh, seems to be going on. The, probably the master of unclear messages was a guy by the name of Yogi Berra. Do any of you know who Yogi Berra was? Okay, a few of you. He was a, he was a baseball player. Played for the New York Yankees and later became the manager of the New York Yankees. And he was famous for making unclear statements. Statements like this. Baseball is 90% mental and the other half is physical. Or nobody goes there anymore. It's too crowded. Did you see the mixed message he's giving? He says, you gotta be careful uh, if, if you don't know where you're going because you might not get there. He said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. He said, you should always go to other people's funerals, otherwise they won't come to yours. And one time there was a lady that said to him, good afternoon, Mr. Barra, you look mighty cool today. And he said, you don't look so hot yourself. So you see, he was the master of unclear messages. And sometimes things can be rather confusing, can't they? But our confusion doesn't always stem from what others are saying. Sometimes we become confused simply because we have such busy schedules and sometimes there's inadequate communication or sometimes mixed messages that are coming our way. You turn on your TV or you turn on the computer, you can find anything you want to find on that, on that uh, computer. I, uh, I have a part-time job where I drive a customer shuttle for uh, Georgian GMC dealership in Barrie. I work from 6.30 in the morning to 12, 12.30, driving customers home and so on. Well, one day I had a customer that, that had to go to Angus. And uh, when we got in the car, he uh, started talking to me and I said, what kind of work do you do? And he said, well, I'm retired now. But he said, I was in the military for many years. And he said, I've learned a lot of things. And I said, oh, really? He said, yeah. For example, he said, you know that most of the leaders we have today are not the real leaders. 
I said, what do you mean? He said, well, like Mr. Trudeau, Mr. Biden, they have been substituted by actors or by clones. And he said, they are not the real people. They're just actors. They're playing out the role that somebody wants them to. I said, oh, that's interesting. And he said, there are prisons. He named five places where these prisons are. Guantanamo Bay was one. And he said, these prisons are so full of prisoners, political prisoners and so on, that they've had to park barges out in the ocean just to hold the prisoners. And I mean, this guy had one crazy idea after another. I was glad to be able to drop him off. <laughs> when it came time to pick him up, I said to the other driver, hey, why don't you go to Angus and pick this guy up? <laughs> he said, okay. I said, when he gets in the car, just ask him this question. What do you think is going on in the world? I set him up, you see. When he got back and he saw me, he just shook his head. <laughs> But there are these confusing messages everywhere. And uh, the question is, what do you know for sure? And uh, in this day and age, sometimes it's difficult to know what is true and what is false. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And there are some things that we know we can count on. There are some things that we can know for sure. And what I want to encourage you today is that the Bible speaks with certain, excuse me, certainty. First of all, like John Wesley, we can be sure when God speaks it in the Bible. We shouldn't question what the Word of God says. The Bible never speaks with timidity. The Bible never says, God never says, here's my opinion on the matter. God says, thus saith the Lord. He speaks with surety. The Bible never says, well, it could be this way or it could be that way. In the Bible, God speaks with a certainty. Just think about a few basic questions and how the Bible addresses those questions. For example, how did life begin? Well, the world says, well, maybe there was a big bang 200 million years ago, and uh, somehow it started an evolutionary chain. And we started out as a tiny blob, and eventually that evolved into bigger and bigger blobs, until finally, here we are today. Now that's simplifying things, but that's basically what they say. Of course, they say we don't have all the links. There are some missing links. They talk about a missing link, but I tell you there are many missing links in their evolutionary idea. And uh, we're, they say we're just missing some links and we're sure that we're gonna find them someday. See how confused the world is? And then every once in a while they say, well, now our science has discovered that our former philosophy or idea was wrong. Our theory was wrong, and here's what we believe now. When I was a child, they, uh, they were the newspapers and, and uh, magazines were announcing that we're heading into a new ice age. You could, you could see the headlines. The world is cooling off into a new ice age. Well, today, they say, no, no, now climate change, we're heading into a warmer and warmer time. And uh, we're all in great trouble. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, that's simple, isn't it? We didn't just hear by accident, there wasn't a sudden explosion in outer space, a big bang that just started everything, but rather, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. God created all forms of life. God created the sea. God created the sky. God created the earth. And then he reached down one day and uh, took some dust of the earth and he formed man and he breathed into man and man became a living soul. That's what the Bible says. 
You say, Brother Pennell, do you really believe that? Yep, that's how it happened. That's why we're here today. You just look at the complexity of the human body, and science still even hasn't figured out all the complexity of the human body, and you tell me that this happened by accident? No, God put all this together. God created, and he breathed into our nostrils the, the, the breath of life, and man became a living soul. That's why mankind is the only one of God's creatures that can communicate with God. The rocks can't communicate with God. The trees can't communicate with God. Your dog and cat can't communicate with God. Only man, because man has a soul. God gave man a soul. So you see, the answer is something you can know for certain. God's word simply put it, it says, in the beginning, God created. Another question. How did we get into this mess that we're in in the world today? Do you realize that some of the finest minds that have ever existed have been trying to answer that question? How did we get to where we are today? Politicians, every election cycle, tell you, I've got the answer. You just elect me, I'll get everything straightened out. And after four or five years, things still aren't straightened out and somebody else rises up and said, they say, that person's wrong, but I've got the answer. And we foolishly elect somebody else thinking that they have the answer to straighten out the mess uh, that we have around us. Sociologists think they have the answer sometimes. Psychologists say that they have the answer. Psychiatrists say they have the answer, although I read an article saying that 75% of psychiatrists went into psychiatric study because of their own psychiatric problems. And yet they're supposed to straighten us out. All are trying to figure out how do we get into this mess and what can we do about it? Why is mankind so violent? Why does man act the way they do? Why has our world become so immoral? Why is there so much poverty? Why are there wars, nation against nation? Why can't we live together in peace? And the world is trying to answer these questions. And some of their answers are quite interesting. Well, they say, it's the fault of the education system. And so we need to change the education system. There's uh, too much pressure on the kids today to succeed, they say. Others say, no, it's not the education system, it's poverty. If we could just give everybody a guaranteed income at a level where they didn't have to worry about buying food and paying their, their housing and so on, that would solve a lot of problems. They say poverty is the cause of the problems today. But my friend, the world gives all these answers and the world is wrong. You can read the Bible and find out the answer. The Bible gives only one answer. The Bible says that we got where we are today because of a three-letter word, S-I-N. When God created the world and put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, he had a perfect utopia there for them. They had food, they had everything they needed. And God just gave them, uh, the only rule that he gave them was don't partake of the fruit of that tree. That's the only thing. And man couldn't do it. Eve took it first, and then Adam took it, and they sinned against God. God said, the day that you partake of that fruit, ye shall surely die. And Adam and Eve partook of that fruit. Now, did they die immediately? Not physically, but spiritually they did. And... Uh, by that sin, everybody that was born into the world adopted that same sin nature then that Adam and Eve had. And we are sinners by birth, and we are sinners by choice. And that's how we got in the mess that we're in. We're a bunch of sinners in this world, disobeying God's laws, going our own way instead of going the way God wants us to go. That's the reason that... Uh, 
you have weeds in your garden, they came as a result of the curse. That's the reason that uh, uh, you ladies had pain in childbirth. That became part of the curse of sin. That's the reason there are diseases in the world. There was no sickness, no disease until Adam and Eve decided to disobey God. That's the reason for poverty. That's the reason for sickness. That's the reason for death. It all came because of sin. So the next question is, well, Brother Pendle, how are we going to get out of this mess? Again, the keen minds of the world try to figure it out. What can we do to solve these problems? Some say, what we got to do is have more gun control. And that would do it. Years ago, there was a program on TV called All in the Family. Any of you familiar with that? Archie Bunker. He was a unique character. And Archie Bunker came up with an idea of how to stop airplane hijackings. He said, we should give everybody a handgun when they get on the plane. And then just collect it from them when they get off. And he said, nobody will hijack the plane. Well, wow, isn't that a simple? That was, that was the way Archie Bunk, Bunker thought. But uh, if we could just solve the unemployment problem, some say, that would take care of everything. But the Bible says, no, if you do all of that, it's not going to change anything until a man is changed on the inside. Many years ago, when I was a Bible college student, I worked for a summer down in St. Louis, Missouri, as an athletic director for a, a Salvation Army. And it was down in the, the slum areas of St. Louis. And in that slum area, they had, the city had, had cleared out an area of slum housing and so on. And they built two beautiful apartment buildings, large ones. And they moved the people where they'd torn down those houses into those apartment buildings. And these apartment buildings were about two years old by the time I was working down there. And some of the people I was working with lived in those apartment buildings. And so I had occasion to go in there and visit. Well, you would go up the elevator and it smelled like an outhouse. People would defecate in there and relieve themselves in the, in the elevator and uh, not take care of that building. And I'd say about 10 years after I was back in Canada, my wife and I were watching the news one night and lo and behold, they were showing two apartment buildings in St. Louis, Missouri, that they had put dynamite all around it and, and uh, moved all the people out and destroyed those two buildings. Why? because the people that moved in had destroyed those buildings from the inside. Here's what happened. They took the people out of the slums, but they didn't take the slum out of the people. That's the difference, friends. You can change people's exterior circumstances, but if they don't change on the inside, nothing's going to change. And my friend, that's what Jesus does when he comes into a life. He changes people from the inside. The big problem is that we have so many social agencies today that are just treating the symptoms. They're not treating the problem. And you can't solve anything by treating the symptoms. You gotta treat the heart. And Jesus does that. The Bible says you can do all that, but it's not gonna change anything until the inside is changed. And my friend, until Jesus Christ comes into a person's life and redeems them, and forgives them, life on this planet is going to be difficult. Again, question, what's going to happen to us after this life is over? That's people have that question. The world has a whole lot of answers. For example, some say, well, when this life is over, we're just going to be reincarnated into a new form of life. If you were bad in this life, you're gonna be reincarnated into a lower form of life in the next one. And if you're good in that form, then you'll be reincarnated into a higher form of life. That's Hinduism. And they wanna teach you to be, that reincarnation is the real thing. But friend, that's not in the Bible. 
God does not say that's the way it happens. The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die. Then cometh the judgment. See, after you die, you're going to have to face God. There's no second chance. You can't come back. You make your decision in this life. And there's no reincarnation. Some people say, well, when you're dead, you're dead. That's all there is to it. You're dead, your body goes into the grave, and that's the end of your existence. No, because when God breathed into man, he became a living soul. And after your body dies, that soul lives on. It's got to spend eternity somewhere. And the Bible says that eternity either is with God in heaven or with Satan and his angels in hell. There's no in-between place. I know the Roman Catholic Church just tried to teach people that there's an in-between place. Purgatory, they call it. You can search the Bible from cover to cover and you'll never find a purgatory. Purgatory is an invention of man. It's not a part of God's plan. You can't, you won't end up in purgatory where you can be hopefully cleansed of your sins, where if you pay the priest or the church enough money and he says enough masses for you that you'll somehow be cleansed and to be able to get out of purgatory and get into heaven. That's a crazy idea. Again, you won't find that in the Bible. What do you know for sure? You better stick with the word of God. Don't worry about the traditions of men. Don't worry about the, the philosophies of men. Just obey the word of God. A preacher by the name of Corcoras tells about conducting a conversation with high school students. And one girl asked, quote, the Bible says that God loves everybody. Then it says God sends people to hell. How can a loving God do that? And the preacher said, I gave her my answer. And she came back with an argument. And I answered her argument. And she responded uh, uh, again with an argument to my answers. And he said, I didn't convince her and she didn't convince me. Pretty soon the session was over. And the preacher went to the young lady and he said, I owe you an apology. He said, I really should not have allowed our discussion to become so argumentative. He said, then I asked, may I share something with you? And she said, yes. And so he said, I took her through the Bible and gave her a basic presentation of the gospel. And he said, when I got to Romans 3.23, which says that the uh, wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, he said, and suggested that all, that all are sinners, she began to cry. And it was then that this high school senior girl said to this preacher, I've been having an affair with a married man. So I didn't want to believe that there was a hell. I didn't want to believe that sinners would go to hell because I know I'm a sinner. And that's where I would end up. Well, her conscience condemned her. And rather than face what the truth of the matter was, it was easier for her to try to deny it. Despite what the world says, my friend, the Bible says that when we finish this life, if Jesus Christ is our Savior, we have the promise of heaven and life with him for all eternity. You know how long eternity is? Forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. When I was in Bible college, I took a correspondence course one summer because the professor that was going to be teaching this particular course in the coming year was extremely boring. And I didn't want to sit through his class, so I decided to get the credit in the summertime so I wouldn't have to attend his class. Anyway, in answering one of the questions in my correspondence course, I said something about spending eternity. And the reply came back, is it possible to spend eternity? And I never forgot that. Because really, you cannot spend eternity. It just is an existence. 
forever and ever. But if you do not accept Jesus Christ as personal Savior, there is no alternative according to the Word of God except spending an eternity without God in hell. So there's no middle ground in the Bible, no multiple choices. The Bible speaks with absolute certainty and it says this is the way it is. Now the world, in contrast, speaks with uncertainty. There's a voice of doubt that says, if there is a God, how could he permit all these things to happen? It seems to me that God's people ought to have preferential treatment. God's people ought to have a better lot in life than everybody else. And yet some people, some of God's people suddenly find themselves afflicted with disease or poverty or the loss of their jobs. How could God allow that if they're God's children? So those people speak the words of doubt. If there really is a God, why would he permit that? And so they conclude, there must not be a God if he allows those things. And then there's the voices of knowledge. We have our sophisticated computer banks that are full of information. We have artificial intelligence today that you can ask, you can get an app on your computer and ask it a question. It'll write you an essay on that particular topic. My grandson, one of my grandsons was over a while back and he said, Grandpa, look at this app I have on my phone. And it was one of those apps for artificial intelligence. And he said, go ahead, ask it a question about any subject that you would like. And you can even ask it what kind of language you want it in. And I said, okay, give me an essay about volcanoes in the Philippines and make it in street language. And this thing came back. Yo, man, that's a, a very dangerous place over there in the Philippines. And it went on and on and on, telling how dangerous it was because of the volcanoes and it sits on the Pacific Rim where there's uh, volcanoes happening all the time and earthquakes happening all the time. And uh, I was amazed. But that's what's available today because of the computers. And so education comes along, knowledge comes along, says all you gotta do is push the right buttons and you get the information you want. Look, you go through a maze of knowledge and yet you ask, what is truth? And you ask the world what is truth and they don't know. Someone has said, if you educate your children without God, all you do is make them a clever devil. True. You need to have God in their education. And so even today, there's an uncertain voice in the area of religion. There are churches all over this area. You can walk into those churches and hear different kinds of messages today, different uh, so-called supports that they, to true truths that they might give you. You go to some place and you'll hear uncertain sounds. For example, some will say at Christmas time, the, vir the virgin birth of Jesus Christ is a myth. Some will say his resurrection is a myth. Some will say that uh, it, 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 Jesus Christ is not really God's son. And that, uh, did he really die on the cross for our sins? These are uncertain sounds that religion gives forth today. And at the same time, there are other people who use religion in order to make money. They make merchandise off of people. And there are some of those, uh, you can see them on TV, and some of them uh, even have mega churches and so on, and they uh, are ripping people off. So many people refer to religious leaders and they say, uh, religious leaders, I don't want to lay a guilt trip on people. So uh, folks, just uh, do what you want to do. Just be sincere. It's all up to you how you live your life. But I want you to know, friends, that God wants you to be sure of some things. He doesn't want you to live in uncertainty. God wants you to be confident 
and to know some things for sure. And that's the reason he spoke those words in 1 John 5 that I read this morning. He says there again, and this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye might, what? Know that ye have eternal life. It's not a hope so, it's a no. God says you can be confident in this. You can be positive in this. God speaks with certainty. Uncertainty leads to destruction. Certainty leads to confidence and courage. Go back and study the martyrs of our Christian faith who died uh, for what they believed. Why did they die? Why did they get burned at the stake? They could have renounced what they said they believed and spared their lives, but they didn't do that. They believed with all their heart the message that they were standing for was true. And there was no wishy-washiness there whatsoever. They were ready to stand up for God and even face death rather than deny him. Let me read you some statements of confident messages in the word of God. Go back with me to the Gospel of John. Chapter 10. And look at verse 14. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and, have no, and am known of mine. Here's something you can know for sure, my friend. Jesus said, I'm a good shepherd. I know you. And he said, and I know those that are mine. You can be sure of that. And he said, I, I know your thoughts. I know what you're thinking. I know every worry you have. I know every concern that you have in your life. I know you so well that I even have the hairs of your head numbered. Go down to verse 35. I'm sorry, let's go over to Romans, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and uh, verse 27. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them that are the called according to his purpose. God says, we can know that. Go down to uh, verse 31. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with, with him also freely give us all things? Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, shall distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? For it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long and are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see the confidence that Paul was speaking with there? He said, I know the Lord has saved me. I know he's going to take care of me. And I know nothing's ever going to separate me from the love of God. Listen, if you have that kind of confidence in your life, you can walk with courage through this life. And you can be confident that God is with you each step of the way. In, uh, back again in 1 John 
chapter 5, where we read earlier here. These are very confident statements. 1 John chapter 5. And he says here, this is the record that God hath given to us, eternal life. This life is in his Son. Where do you get eternal life? In the Son of God. That's what it says right there. You don't get it through doing good works. You don't get it through going to church. You can't buy your way into it. You, you don't have enough money. Nobody has enough money to buy their way into heaven or eternal life. It only comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, that's why it tells us there that, that he that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. I don't care how good a person is. I don't care how much money they give to charity. I don't care what kind of a reputation they have. If they have not got the Son of God, they have not got life. So the question this morning is, do you have the Son of God? Are you saved? Can you point to a time in your life when you received Jesus Christ as personal Savior? If you can point to that, then you have the Son, and you have life. And uh, by the way, you're never going to lose that life. It's eternal. If it was uh, not eternal, he would say, I give you temporary life. But he doesn't give temporary life. He gives eternal life. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. And why did he say those things in verse 13? These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life, and they may believe on the name of the Son of God. A deeply moving incident happened during junior high week at a Christian camp. And even though this was a Christian camp, like other summer camps, there were a number of children there uh, who were not Christian. They were not saved. And uh, so they treated another one of the campers with heartless ridicule. This other camper, this young man, was, was, uh, had uh, uh, spastic paralysis, and so his speech was halting. And when he would uh, ask a question, the boys would uh, deliberately mock him by answering him uh, in the same spastic way that, that he spoke, halting and mimicking him. And one night his cabin group chose him to lead the devotions in their cabin uh, before the entire camp. And it was one more effort on their part to try to have fun at this boy's expense. And unashamedly, the spastic boy stood up and in his strained and slurred manner, each word coming with enormous effort, he said simply, Jesus loves me and I love Jesus. And he sat down pretty soon. People were weeping. Weeping because that simple little message spoke to hearts. And some campers were convicted and came to know Christ. Do you love Jesus? He loves you. Is Jesus your Savior? Can you say with assurance, Jesus loves me and I love Jesus? Amen. And if it's not true this morning, now we extend this invitation to you. The invitation comes from Jesus himself. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest for your souls. You can come to Jesus today. Now maybe you're already a Christian. Maybe you're looking for a church home. May I encourage you to consider this one. Pray about this one. This is a good spot for you. Pastor Johnson and his wife are good, godly Christians. And come and join this church and join this ministry. And uh, I, I pray that God will help you to know the certainties of your Christian faith. God can help you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in this day of uncertainty, 
I pray that you would give each of us a certain voice. May we be a trumpet that blows a certain sound, not an uncertain one. May people know that when we speak, we're speaking on the authority of God's word. I pray, Lord, for those who are here that maybe have been having some doubts. I pray that you'd straighten out those doubts today. May they depend wholly upon your word. I ask, Lord, that if there are any here that are not saved, they're not sure that they have the Son, they're not sure that they've been born again, then, Lord, please speak to those hearts, and may they come to know Christ as personal Savior today. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed for just a few moments, and with our heads bowed and eyes closed, do we have any that would say, Brother Pendle, God spoke to my heart today? If you ask me, if I was 100% sure if I died today, I was going to heaven, I would have to say, no, I'm not sure. I need your prayers. Would you slip your hand up long enough for me to see it? Put it back down. Say, I'm not sure. I'm not certain of that. Please pray for me today. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. And I pray that you would help each one of us now to be certain of our salvation and be certain of the things that the Word of God teaches us. For these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.